shame is the rudder that has guided my life. I think growing up Catholic added this whole weird layer of intense shame about something I was that, and I couldn't define in high school from 1986 to 1989. There wasn't, I didn't even, I didn't even know the word gay, let alone what that meant. There was no coming out, right? And so there was this weird feeling. I knew I was broken from the time I was 10, probably. I knew I was broken and, and that, the, the weight of that and not being able to put a word around it is debilitating. How I compensated for that was I tried to be perfect in all, all, all the areas I could. I tried to stand out um, I, in, and be an extrovert um, so that nobody knew the secret. Working under those conditions over, you know, over decades is exhausting, exhausting. And so when when drugs come as an, as, and, and can alleviate some of that pressure, some of, some of us, me in particular, because I'll talk about my story, I dove in knee deep and, th and was ready to just give it all away. I didn't start using drugs until I was 28. I had a very normal upbringing. I had a very normal high school experience. I went to college and had a pretty, I think, normal college experience. And I can remember um, I had two best, best girlfriends. One night we tried cocaine for the first time. And I can remember being in the walk-in in this restaurant in San Mateo where we worked. And I can remember trying it the very, I, I, I viscerally feel it right now. Like what it was like to try a stimulant for the first time. I knew that day that it was gonna be a problem. I knew it. And shortly thereafter, all things uh, went haywire. I was introduced to crystal meth. I was introduced to GHB. I'm the type of person that um, once I start, I cannot stop. It's in the literature for, for 12 step. And that day was the precursor to me having a decade long drug addiction. One that would lead me to throw away my degree. One that would um, cause me to get arrested not once not twice, but three times. One that would drive me to abscond on my probation and amass a massive debt that I would eventually have to pay off. One that eventually led me to serial convert and get HIV. All that happens because of my addiction. You remove the drugs from the equation and none of that happens. When you're super high, your, your ability to rationalize and make good decisions about, your, um, about what you're doing sexually is uh, greatly inhibited. We'll just leave it at that. For me, uh, HIV and addiction are inextricably linked together. I know for certain that my behaviors, my willingness to do things high were the reason that I was in a situation where I could get HIV, full stop, period. So I found out that I was HIV positive in 2011. I was in a hotel um, that, my, that my partner and I were using at the time to deal dope out of. And I got really, 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 really sick. The only place to go, the place to go was Magnet. So I went to Magnet. Shout out to Magnet for, um, for helping folks that are in the struggle with their substance use. They gave me my diagnosis and they did it in a super compassionate way. And then um, the shame stepped in and I figured uh, now I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a drug addict. Um, I'm I'm dealing drugs as my major source of income now, or one of them, and, uh, and I'm HIV positive, so I guess all, all bets are off, and we're just gonna do this until we die. And that's basically the, that's the deal I made with myself. It looks like I'm doing this till I die. I can't use anything. I have been sober, or free of all substances, since November 17th, 2013.
What changed after 13 years of being a drug addict? Well, I, uh, I was gonna go to prison at some point. Like, that's where I was headed. I was, uh, you know, I was doing things that would land people in prison. That's it, full stop. Uh, and I guess I decided that I didn't wanna die. There's this thing about recovery where generally folks are, are, are guided there by seeing other folks recover. Fortunately, I had somebody that I had, I had been friends with for quite some time, over a decade already. Um, and we were quite close. Uh, I, he got sober. I would chit chat with him from a distance because I was too scared to actually have that conversation. And he gently nudged me in the right direction. The direction was inpatient rehab, um, inpatient rehab, and then after inpatient rehab, the willingness to live in a sober living environment for um, the next year and a half. So my initial recovery took about two years, I'd say about two years. I was in a program for about two years. One of my favorite authors talks about the shame spiral, the shame spiral that once you're in it, it's very hard to pull yourself out of it. You almost need to be, you need to be completely removed from your environment in order to, to make that change and that's what I did. I had to say goodbye to everything up, up until that point. I got rid of my phone numbers, I got rid of my email addresses, I, got, I gave away everything I had had up until that point and I went to rehab with a backpack, literally a backpack and that was it. I had a pair of shoes, a pair of shorts, a t-shirt, and a jacket. What I've seen since I've, since I've been sober is folks get scared after, after, their, after the initial point of getting, clean, of getting sober and then fall back into old ways or old friendships that probably aren't the best for them. So you, I had to create a whole new community of folks in order that had my best interest at heart and that, um, that we're on the same path. So I think growing up as a closeted gay cisgendered man, what I was always looking for was a community of like-minded people. I tried to find that on the dance floor at the end up. I tried to find that um, through a decade of what I thought gay men did to bond, I, I falsely created a sense of community when I was, uh, when I was getting high. Um, and I don't think I ever really experienced the, the true meaning of community until I was sober. I think that if I didn't have a community of support, of support that I could reach out, every, reach out to every morning on my gratitude list, I, I would find it real easy to fall back into complacency. I think community is the reason, is one of the primary reasons that folks are able to stay sober. COVID-19 and recovery has definitely been awkward. Now, the recovery community here in San Francisco is pretty savvy. Um, we're pretty lucky in that regard. So we were, we were, we were able to eat, like pretty quickly transition to online formats, but there's still the folks that don't have digital equity that are also trying to recover. I remember being the person that went to, went to, went to rehab in 2013 and had to use funds from the AIDS emergency fund in order to buy a phone so I could communicate with my sponsor. If I'm hopelessly strung out and trying to get help, I am not connecting to digital Zoom meetings to try and figure that out. That's just not happening. So in-person meetings are super important. There's, a, there's an analogy that I like to use around around recovery. It's this concept around wanting wanting to hurry up and recover, right? Like I want, I want, I want a, I want a job 
and I want a, I want a, I want a house and I want a dog and I want a partner and uh, and I want money in the bank and I want to go on a great vacation and all that and I want it now and that's not possible right there's this concept in Buddhism like you walk into a forest right for for me, I, I walked 13 years into this forest, right? It's, it's pretty inconceivable that I'm gonna be able to turn around 13 years in and make it back out in anything less than probably 13 years, right? So I have been sober now almost seven. So I, I feel like I am, I'm on my way back out of the forest. And I think that the legacy of, of what I want to leave is that I recognize all the work, all the work that was done before me to allow me to sit in this spot. 